Good. Shall we start? Yeah. Good. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So, last time we, in the last session, we finished on the Battle of Mukta. And in that battle, we discussed that the Muslims fought against the Ghassanids. And the Ghassanids were allied to the Romans. So, about 20,000 of them fought against uh, Muslims, about 33,000 Muslims. And the Muslims were led by Zaid bin Haris, and then he was martyred as well. Jaffa bin Abi Talib then took the banner, then he was martyred. And then Abdullah bin Rabaha then took the banner and he was martyred as well. And then Khalid bin Walid uh, was, became the general. And then he took a tactical retreat and he brought the army safely back to, uh, safely back to Medina. Okay. So now after the Battle of Mu'ta, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then sent an expedition uh, which was called the Battle of Dhat al-Salasil. So anyone remembers from last year, the Battle of Dhat al-Salasil? Last year? Yes, last year. Dhat al-Salasil. So when Omar, sorry, during the reign of Abu Bakr, right, to when the war with the Persians started, so the first major battle that the Muslims fought against the Persians was also called Dhat al-Salasil. Right? So there are two Dhat al-Salasil battles. So the first battle that the, that the Muslims uh, fought against the Persians, in English it is called the Battle of the Chains because the armies, they were chained, the, Pers the Persian army, they were chained, chained together so that they could not escape. They were uh, slaves, so they were chained together and therefore that battle was called Zad al-Salasil or the Battle of the Chains. Right? So it, this battle is not to be confused with that battle which happened during the reign of Abu Bakr. Okay? So this was a small expedition which was sent by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the leader was Amr bin al-Haz, right? And then later, Muhammad sent an, uh, uh, another reinforcement under the leadership of uh, Abu Baida bin Jarrah, okay? <clears throat> and it was against the tribe of Qudara because this tribe had helped the Ghassanids against the Muslims during the Battle of Mu'ta, okay? So therefore, the Muslims went there and took the tribe by surprise, right? And they won a lot of war to booty because of this particular expedition, and they came back. Okay. Now, after the Battle of Zat of Salasil, which happened during uh, the eighth year of Hijra, Jamaat Thani, eighth year of Hijra, then, uh, uh, as we know from after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, one of the clauses in Treaty of Hudaybiyah was that the Muslims and the Quraysh they can enter into alliance with any of the tribes that they wanted to, and they would not stop each other in entering into an alliance. Okay. So the Muslims entered into in, in, an alliance with Banu Puzah. Anyone remembers from the first lesson, Banu Puzah? Who were Banu Puzah? Why are they so famous? Yes, thank you. What else? <laughs> from the uh, Sunday session that we had regarding Ibrahim alayhi salam, and we, we mentioned that Ismail alayhi salam, he married into the tribe of Jurhum, which was which was from Yemen. Okay, and then this tribe of Jurhum basically became the custodians of the Kaaba for thousands of years. And then uh, eventually they become corrupt, they became corrupt. So this tribe, Khuzah, they kicked Jurhum out and then they took the custodianship of Kaaba. And in the first session, I mentioned that idolatry was introduced into Arabia by the chieftain of the tribe of Khuzah, by the name of Amr ibn Luhay al Khuzai. Okay, so he went to Syria, and in Syria he saw people worshipping idols, and they were a mighty civilization. So he said, why not we just emulate them, why not we just copy them? So he brought the idol with them, by the name of Kubal. Okay, and he placed it in Mecca, and then from since then on, idolatry spread into Arabia. Okay, so this is the same tribe, Banu Khuzah. And then what happened was, that uh, the great great grand the great great grandfather of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam or the great 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 grandfather so muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam bin abdullah bin uh, abdul muttalib bin hashim bin hashim bin abmana bin qusay okay so qusay was the one who then retook makkah from the banu khuza okay <laughs> so uh, Kusay, then the Quraysh and Jurhum, they were then sent outside in the outskirts of Makkah and they were not inside Makkah and uh, Banu Khuzah was inside Makkah. So Kusay was the one who then retook Makkah from Banu Khuzah and then the Quraysh settled back into Makkah. Okay. 
So Banu Khuzaa then entered into alliance with the Muslims, and many, uh, many of the people from Banu Khuzaa they became Muslim. And then Banu Bakar was another tribe which was still on paganism, and it entered into an alliance with the Quraysh. And Banu Bakar and Banu Khuzaa they were having a war for centuries, as you know that in the Jahiliya days they used to have wars. So let's say my camel crossed into your territory, and now I'm going to fight a war against you. Okay. Now they'll be fighting war for generations and generations, and the later generations would forget what they were fighting about, but they would still be fighting against each other because their forefathers were doing it. Okay. So this is this was what used to happen during the days of Jahiliya. So this happened. The same thing happened with Banu Bakar and Banu Khuzaa. They were fighting for centuries against each other. Now Banu Bakar is an ally to the Quraysh. Banu Khuzaa is an ally to the Muslims. And Banu Bakar wants revenge for the people that have been killed in the wars previously. Okay, and also Banu Bakar and Banu Khuzaa they have a natural enmity, enmity amongst themselves because of the uh, history of war amongst them. So what Banu Bakar does is that it plans a raid. So a raid in the days of Jahiliya. So the default was war. The tribes were at war against each other unless they enter into an alliance. Okay, so which meant that one tribe could attack another tribe without a warning, take the flocks, take the sheep, take the camels, whatever, and then go back. Okay, so this this used to happen. That 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 is called a raid. Right, that is the classic definition of a raid. That you just go attack, maybe kill one or two people, and then you take the flocks, take the sheep, take the land, and you not the land, but take the crops or whatever, and then you will come back to your own tribe. Okay. So Banu Bakar wanted to do that with Banu Khuzaa, and they planned it along with the Quraysh, and the Quraysh actively helped them. And they said that we are just going to do a raid. So how is how are the Muslims going to know that we helped them? So then, when Banu Bakar attacked Banu Khuzaa, so at that time, uh, the people of Banu Khuzaa, coincidentally, were uh, awake at that time, right? So they attacked them during night. They wanted to take as much flocks of sheep, as much camels as they can. But the people of Khuzaa at that time, it was Allah's father that they were awake, right? And then what happened? A small skirmish ensued, and twenty people from Banu Khuzaa were killed. And Banu Bakar then uh, went back into their into their own into their own places where they used to live. Okay. Now Banu Khuzaa then uh, went to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The chieftain went to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then he asked for help from the Muslims because the Muslims were in allies were allies with them. So then, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent an emissary to the Quraysh, and he demanded three things. Okay, so one of the three, right? So he said that either you pay the blood money for the victims, right? So blood money was so twenty twenty people were killed. So how many camels? Yes. Yeah, so how many camels in total? Yes. Yes. That's like what? That's like two thousand Ferraris. <laughs> yeah, like two thousand Ferraris, right? So you either pay two thousand Ferraris or camels, right? Or You <laughs> terminate the alliance with Banu Bakar. So, or the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. If you do none of that, then we will render Treaty of Hudaybiyah to be void. Okay, so it will not be applicable anymore. So then, what happened was that the Quraysh, because people were accepting Islam, so Banu Bakar were the few uh, tribes which were surrounding Makkah that were still on idolatry, still on paganism. So the Quraysh valued their alliance with them a lot. So what they did, they were not willing to let go of the alliance. So they dispatched Abu Sufyan in order to uh, rejuvenate, refresh the Treaty of Hudaybiya with Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. So then Abu Sufyan went to Medina, and then he first went to his daughter, who was his daughter. <laughs> Aisha with the Abu Bakar. I'm talking about Abu Sufyan. Yeah. Thank you. Umm <laughs> Habiba, Ramla bint Abu Sufyan. She was uh, one of the wives of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he went to his own daughter, and then uh, Umm Habiba basically declined to uh, help him against Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then he went to Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr also declined. Then he went to Umar radhiyallahu anhu, and Umar radhiyallahu anhu said, "I'm going to help you." No way, and then he went to Ali Rabi'ul Ta'ala, and then Ali Rabi'ul Ta'ala basically said that he's not going to help, but he can go. Abu Sufyan can go to the mosque, and then in the mosque he can ask if anyone is going to, is willing to help him. Then Abu Sufyan went to the mosque and asked if anyone is willing to help him, but nobody helped him. Okay, then Abu Sufyan went back to Quraysh and he reported that he is not able to get any help from the people of Medina. Okay, so now the Quraysh are not willing to 
give the blood money they are not terminating the alliance and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not going to accept anything else okay so now the treaty of hudaybiyah has been broken and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam can now officially launch a war against the quraysh as we mentioned that the muslims muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam not uh, the muslims later but uh, the muslims then and muhammad under the leadership of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they never broke any treaty they never broke any treaty okay unless the other party broke the treaty okay and this is the sunnah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he never never ever any on the promise and this is what the muslims should be doing okay so now <clears throat> muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, told the people of madina all of madina the entire madina and all the muslims the muslim tribes that had accepted islam to prepare for a ma- massive war okay a battle and the muslims are preparing for a battle but no one knows where they are going okay and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as was his uh, as was the sunnah as well that he used to he used to have this genius war tactics okay so what he used to do was that he used to send an expedition up north and then he used to go to south right so this was his uh, uh, this was his uh, uh, military mind right his military mind was uh, amazing so what he did was he sent an expedition up north which gave an illusion to the people of arabia that they are going up north maybe against the byzantines against the romans or against the masanids okay and that expedition this came back and then muhammad sallam at the last moment he told everyone that they are going to makkah okay and they are going to conquer makkah now when muhammad sallam told the people that they are going to conquer makkah then this one particular sahabi by the name of hatib bin abi balta okay this sahabi was uh, maula anyone knows what maula is what maula used to be is he not there so anymore huh sorry maula is a freed slave oh slave. yes yeah. so now basically in the days of jahiliya uh when you were a maula you were basically like a you can say a third class citizen so you did not had the protection of the tribe but still people accepted you because you had some affiliation you were a slave before okay so <clears> hatib <throat> ibn abi balta was a freed slave of the quraish and then he accepted islam migrated to madina okay and then he was also in the previous session we discussed about muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam sending the emissaries to egypt to maqawqas okay and he was the one who took the letter to maqawqas okay so hatib then sent a letter he he wrote a letter and in that letter the content was that he told he was telling the quraish that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is attacking you so take necessary precautions okay Why? yeah we are coming we are coming to that so <clears throat> now he told another lady right he told the lady i am going to pay you some money you take this letter do not open it do not give it to anyone and <clears throat> take it straight to the quraish and give it to them so now the lady is taking that letter to the quraish and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is told about that letter by jibril alaihi salam now muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam dispatches sali and zubair and also two other sahabi by the name of muqtad and abu murtad abu murtad okay these four sahabi are dispatched in order to catch up with the lady now these four sahabi they catch up with the lady and they tell they ask her to give the give the letter but the lady says that she does not have any letter but then when they become angry then the lady then takes out the letter from her from her hair and gives it to them okay. now the letter reaches muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the lady also comes and the lady is arrested of course she comes and then muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam ask her who gave it to you then she says that hatib gave it to me and then muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam called hatib and he said that did you uh, wrote this letter he said yes i did and then there was one particular sahabi he said let me kill him he is a munafiq who was that sahabi anyone can oh, thank you <laughs> so then uh, umar radhiya taala jumped up and he said that let me kill him he is a munafiq and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said let's listen to him first so then hatib said that my family because his family maybe we can assume that it was a slave family as well so his family was in makkah he was freed but his family probably was not free we can assume that and he said that uh you all have uh, tribal relationships in makkah and if you are going to conquer makkah your tribal relationships is going to save your family which is going to be there in makkah okay whereas my family does not have any tribal affiliations so i was trying to gain a favor with the quraish so that if you conquer so that when you conquer because he was sure that the muslims are going to conquer because the help of allah was with, was with the muslims so he said when you conquer then the quraish are not going to harm my family okay so that is the justification that he gave 
then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned to Umar Radiallahu Anhu and he said that he is the one who participated in the Battle of Badr. Okay. And Allah said about the people of Badr that he, they, are, they are forgiven. Okay. So therefore Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also, also forgave Hatim. Okay. Now after this incident then Allah revealed the uh, the verse of Surah Surah Muntahana, the first verse. Oh believe, believers do not take my enemies and yours as trusted allies. Okay. So do not take the enemies. So this is reference to Hatib that do not take the enemies, do not think that the enemies are going to be the allies. Okay? Do not think that the enemies of Allah and his messenger are going to be allies. And therefore a strict prohibition of finding any kind of uh, finding any kind of yeah, taking any kind of help from the enemies of Allah and his messenger was revealed in this particular particular ayah. Okay. Yes. So the enemies in the ayah is Enemies is the Quraysh, and he's taking help from. Uh, he's uh, Hatib is taking help from the Quraysh. So Allah is saying that do not take help from the enemies of Allah and His Messenger. Okay, he's addressing Hatib and basically all the Sahaba and saying that the enemies are not your friends. Okay. Now, after that, then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left for Makkah on the tenth of Ramadan of the eighth year of Hijrah, and for the nine for nine days they marched. And they came near uh, Makkah, right? And they settled in a place which is called Maral Dahran. And as you can see here as well, this Mar Mar Maral Dahran that was called in the books of Sira is called Wadi Fatima here, right? So it's about twelve hours, uh, twelve hours of walk away from Makkah. Right? So now, when they settle here, then they are joined by Abbas. Abbas, who was Abbas? Right. Yeah, Abbas. How? So who, who is he? Mm -hmm. How is he related to the Prophet? His uncle. His uncle. Good. Good. Right, so Abbas, it is basically a, uh, a dispute amongst the scholars when the when Abbas accepted Islam. Okay, so some say that it was during the conquest of Makkah, just before the conquest of Makkah, that he accepted Islam. Some say that it was uh, after the Battle of Badr that he accepted Islam, but for sure he joined the Muslims when they were conquered, when they were marching towards Makkah. Okay, so he, he was staying in Makkah, and then he joined the Muslims at this juncture. Okay. Now, uh, one small tidbit that I forgot to mention was that when the Muslims when they were marching towards Makkah and they arrived in this place called Al Qadid, so they broke their fast because it was Ramadan, so they were fasting. And when people are traveling, the concession is given that they can break their fast and they can make it up the, after Ramadan. Okay, so the Muslims did what the Muslims did was that they started the day with fasting, and then when they marched and they reached the outskirts of Medina in this place called Al Qadid, then they broke their fast and then they intended to make it up later. Okay, now on the way as well, Abu Sufyan bin Al Harith and Abdullah bin Abi Umayyah, they also came to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. So Abu Sufyan bin Al Haris, uh, from the first or the, or the second session, I mentioned that the foster brothers of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the foster brother was Abu Sufyan bin Al Haris, and Al Haris is the son of Abdul Muttalib. Right? So Abu Sufyan bin Al Haris is the first cousin of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, and Abdullah bin Abi Umayyah is the son of Atika, and Atika is the daughter of Abdul Muttalib. Okay, so both of them are the first cousins of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were very close friends with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when Muhammad Sallam declared prophethood and invited them to Islam, then what they did, they began mocking the message of Islam and they began mocking Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, so they became enemies of Islam when the Muhammad Sallam declared his prophethood. So when they heard that the Muslims are approaching Makkah, okay, so then they go and they decide to accept Islam and become Muslims. And Umm Salama was one of the wives of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Umm Salama. Umm Salama's father and Abdullah bin Abi Umayyah's father both both had the same father, right? So they had different mothers, but both had the same father. So they basically they were step uh, step siblings, okay? Umm Salama and Abdullah bin Abi Umayyah. So Abdullah bin Abi Umayyah goes to Umm Salama, and then he pleads with Umm Salama to for to uh, grant an audience with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay? So then Umm Salama then goes to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and tells Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that. Uh, Abu Sufyan bin Al Haris and Abdullah bin Abi Umayyah, they are waiting for you and they want an audience with you. Then Muhammad Sallam refused. He said that I have no need for them because of the hurt that they have given, because of the years of mocking 
because of the wars that they fought then muhammad sallam said that i don't need i don't i don't have anything to do with that but then abu sufyan bin al haris then he wrote a poem because he, he used to write poems as well against islam but then he wrote a poem now for islam and for muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then he recited that poem so then muhammad sallam uh, accepted their defeat and then they accepted islam uh, at this particular juncture okay so now two of the cousins of muhammad sallam they accept islam and the uncle of muhammad sallam also joined the army of the muslims okay now the muslims are camped at mar al dahran and abbas then uh, abbas then uh, asked muhammad sallam to let him go to uh, let him go to makkah and then to try to negotiate right i try to come to some sort of settlement with the people of makkah okay. now abbas goes to makkah and there on the outskirts of makkah he sees abu sufyan abu Suf- this abu sufyan is abu sufyan bin hat uh, the abu Suf- the abu sufyan the leader of makkah okay and hakim bin hizam hakim bin hizam anyone remembers hakim bin hizam no he was the nephew of khadija and during the boycott of the muslims he was one of those who helped the muslims with food and food and water right with the supplies and also budail bin barqa al khuzai so budail bin barqa was also one of the people who negotiated with the muslims on behalf of the quraish during the treaty of hudaybiyah okay so these three people were just uh, uh, these three people were on the outskirts of makkah and they were observing who are coming right and they were debating among, amongst themselves who is who is who is coming because they were not sure whether they are muslims or whether they are someone else so now abu sufyan uh, so sorry budail then tells to abu sufyan and also to uh, hakim hakim bin nizam that these are probably my people okay these are from banu khuzair and they are coming they are coming to makkah but then abbas then over, over here says and he says to abu sufyan that no these are not your people these are not from banu khuzair these are the muslims these are uh, amongst the command of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam under the command of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they are coming to conquer makkah okay. then abu sufyan he panics when he hears this he panics so abbas then tells abu sufyan to come uh, on his on his on his uh, particular uh, mule so that mule you guys know what mule is right so mule is uh, an animal like a donkey so that mule muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's mule was called duldul okay and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave that mule to abbas for this particular uh, for this particular and uh, for in order to negotiate with the quraish okay so this is a strong symbolism that he's coming on the animal of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself okay so then abu sufyan rides on this particular animal along with abbas and they have an audience with muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay then muhammad sallam tells uh, abbas to basically let abu sufyan rest for one day and then abu sufyan rest for one day and then the next day this is abu sufyan bin hat that we're talking about right not abu sufyan bin harris so do not get confused so now the next day Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked Abu Sufyan don't you believe that there is only one god Allah okay isn't hasn't the time come for you to believe in just one god so then Abu Sufyan says Abu Sufyan said that i see a lot of army right and if our gods are were, were able to help us they would help us by now okay so it's uh, it's very clear that there is only one god okay now Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then said that isn't it clear to you that i am the messenger of Allah okay and now abu sufyan said that my parents be ransom for you so that was an expression right so that was an expression of respect but then he was hesitant in accepting muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the messenger of allah okay then abbas basically nudged him and he said that look i have done a lot of help for you so you should help me now okay and you should accept islam <laughs> so then abu sufyan then accepted islam uh went to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said that he is accepting islam so he took the shahada accepted islam okay so now abu sufyan the leader of makkah is now accepted islam as well and then abbas then asked muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to honor abu sufyan because abu sufyan was uh, the leader of makkah and he had accepted islam sorry yes 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 so muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then said that uh, we are going to enter makkah tomorrow so he the general message that he gave to the people of makkah was this one so we are going to enter makkah tomorrow whoever is in the haram shall be safe whoever is in his own house shall be safe and whoever is in the house of abu sufyan shall be safe right so this was the honor that muhammad sultan gave to abu sufyan that his house became a sanctuary okay now abu sufyan was observing the muslim army under muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam people from different tribes united under the banner of islam and this was something of course that the the mind 
of a person who is from the jahiliya could not grasp it right how can people from different tribes be under the leadership of one person okay and jahiliya the trademark of jahiliya was that you had tribalism tribal system okay and the tribal uh, loyalty was above everything else and jahiliya why is it called that islam was like a like a civilizational mission for the arabs why because the arabs were not united okay they were divided into different tribes and it is my tribe against your tribe that was the default right and unless you enter into an alliance and unless different tribes enter into an alliance okay so they never had a central authority and now it it seems like the arabs are coming under a central authority right and later on uh, after two years then the entire arabia will united will be united under the, under the leader, leadership of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay so muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then became the first leader of arabia the entire arabian peninsula okay so now abu sufyan is amazed and then he goes to uh, abbas and he says that yeah, i am amazed by the kingship of your nephew okay because he thinks that he is a king but then abbas says that this is not kingship this is prophethood then abu sufyan agrees okay prophethood okay. and then afterwards now muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is uh, now this is 19th of ramadan and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has divided the army into three okay. and khalid bin walid is in charge of the right flank okay and in the middle in which muhammad sallam is also in the middle but the person who is in charge is abu baida bin sarra okay and the one on the left saad bin ubada is in charge saad bin ubada is one is from the tribe of khazraj so he's uh, an ansari okay he's he's from the ansar so now saad bin ubada he, he says uh, because he sees the conquest so he says something to this effect right today is a day of day of war sanctuary is no more so he is basically saying we are going to go into makkah and we are going to kill a lot of people okay because they have killed our people so now we are going to conquer them and kill okay now saad bin ubada when he said this abu sufyan heard it and abu sufyan abu sufyan bin harb the, the the chief of makkah who had just accepted islam now abu sufyan then went to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then he complained that this is what saad bin ubada said so then muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that saad bin ubada has made a mistake so this is not a day of malhama malhama means malhama means war right malhama this is not a day, day of malhama this is a day of marhama right which means mercy okay so this is a day of marhama so now saad bin ubada had the flag so muhammad sallam took the flag from him and then in one version it says gave the flag to zubair bin awam another version it says gave the flag to ali in in the third version it says gave the flag to qais but qais was the uh place was the son of uh, saad bin ubada okay so whatever so one of the three got the flag so probably zubair got the flag okay so now zubair is in charge and uh, abu bada is in charge and khalid bin walid is, is in charge okay and all three of them are qurayshi all three of them are from makka okay now uh, muhammad sallam then abu sufyan then asked muhammad sallam to go to makka and then to inform the people of makka that the army of the muslims are uh, is coming so then muhammad sallam then gives him the go ahead gives him the green signal so therefore abu sufyan then goes to makkah and then cries out loud okay so the army of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is coming so therefore you should you should either uh, seek refuge in in your own houses right so he first said seek refuge in my house or your own houses or the haram okay now as muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said okay so then now the hind hind uh, you know who hind is the wife of abu sufyan yeah and what another part she played in the sira before uh kill the man that was he was the concern he liver yeah <laughs> yeah so him him was the wife of abu sufyan so why did she do that any idea why because he killed the me uh he killed the man like Yes. 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 Uh, I think you are confusing with uh, uh, who was the one uh, who gave the order to kill. Who was the the owner of Pashi? Jubair. Uh, Jubair ibn Mutaim, if I'm not mistaken, right? So Jubair ibn Mutaim, his his uh, his uncle and uh, no, it was not Jubair ibn Mutaim. I'll have to confirm, right? But him, his father was killed. Him bin Utba bin Abi Rabia. Okay. so his father was killed okay i think it was jubair ibn mutaim he owned bahshi and then his uncle was killed his father was killed and his uh, also cousin was also killed right so then he gave the order to bahshi you know to kill hamza okay that are in the battle of uhud and uh, in his father his own father utba bin rabia he was killed utba shayba and 
Udba Sheba was the one who participated in the Mubarazah okay, against Hamza and Hamza killed Udba. So therefore, Hind then took the revenge in this manner that she uh, opened the body and then she chewed the liver. Okay. So Hind then became enraged and she was the wife of Abu Sufyan. So she went in the middle and then she smacked Abu Sufyan, took his mustache and pulled it around like this. right? And she said that, how come you are such a coward? Okay. So you should be killed for this, for saying something like this. And Abu Sufyan says that I, uh, you, you have no choice because the army is too big. Okay. So it, it cannot be fought. So now the people of Makkah, then they are going inside their houses, but a few of them, right? Uh, three of them, three of them, the three prominent amongst them, Barikrama bin Abi Jahal, who was the son of Abija, Abu Jahal, okay? And Suhail bin Amr. Suhail bin Amr was the one, his, his two sons, both of them had, had accepted Islam, but he had more sons as well, but the two sons that are prominent in Sira, they had accepted Islam, Abu Jandal and Abdullah. And Abu Jandal, you guys remember from the Treaty of Qudaybiyah, he was... Uh, he was uh, the one who was negotiating with the Muslims. And then his son came in chains because he had chained his own son. You remember? So Abu Jandal was, became a Muslim. Abdullah also became a Muslim. And Suhail bin Amr was not a Muslim. He was the chief of Makkah. So then he also decided to fight. And the third person who decided to fight was Safwan bin Umayyah. And he was the son of Umayyah bin Khalaf. Anyone knows Umayyah bin Khalaf? Okay. Abu Jahal, anyone knows? Uh, everyone knows. Umayyah bin Khalaf, who was Umayyah? Yes. Mm. Very good. So Umayyah bin Khalaf was the owner of Bilal Radhiallahu So he used to torture Bilal Radhiallahu and he was killed as well during the Battle of Badr by Bilal Radhiallahu okay. So the three of them decided to fight. Okay, and then Khalid bin Walid, Muhammad Sallallahu then ordered Khalid bin Walid to go from this side. Okay, so if you can see, this is Arabic. This is Khalid bin Walid. So he's going from the uh, south side, southern side, from the side, from the road that led to Yemen, from Makkah, okay? So Khalid bin Walid is going from the southern side, and then Zubair is coming from the northern side, into Makkah. And then Abu Ubaidah and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are coming from the valley somewhere on the center, center north side, okay? Because they are coming from the north, they are coming from Medina, so they are all gathered towards the north of Makkah. Khalid bin Walid is going around the entire Makkah, coming from the south, and Zubair is going further north and entering Makkah towards the north. And then the, the rest are entering Makkah from the north, north center. Okay. Abu Baida and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Khalid bin Walid, his contingent and this, is then attacked by the people who were with Agrama and Safwan and uh, Suhail bin Amr. Okay? And then 12 of the Qurayshis are killed and two Muslims are martyred. Okay? But other than that, in the conquest of Makkah, other than these 14, no one is killed in actual battle. Okay. So this is one of the unique conquests in the history of mankind, not just in the history of Islam, that a conquest takes place in which there is not just no killing, but there's a prohibition of killing because Muhammad Sallallahu prohibited these people not to kill anyone or not to fight against anyone unless they fight you. Okay? Unless they're trying to kill you, then you can, of course, fight fight them back. But other than other than that, there is no fighting on this day. Okay, So this was the unique a unique conquest in the history of mankind. Okay? Now Muhammad Sallallahu enters Makkah with his entire army and he has basically conquered Makkah okay, because there is no resistance and the resistance that is there has also been overcome. So now Muhammad then is on his camel and he circumambulates the Kaaba on his camel. Okay, he does the tawaf and then there are many idols in the uh, in the Makkah. So what he does is, is that he points his staff on the idols, he points it at them and then he recites this particular ayah Truth has come and falsehood has, de has departed. Indeed, falsehood, falsehood is uh, bound to depart. Okay, so this is the ayah of the Quran. And then he recites this ayah and then he points his staff at the idols. Okay, and there's these idols that break one by one. Okay, and all the idols that are in the vic in this vicinity of the Kaaba, they are all broken. Then Muhammad Sallam then asks for the keys of the Kaaba. The keys of the Kaaba is with the family of whom? Any idea? <laughs> Uthman bin Talha. So there were three Sahabi who had accepted Islam uh, in in the last session we uh, discussed it, right? Just before the conquest of Makkah. So there one was Khalid bin Walid, right? And one was Uthman bin Talha. Okay. And the third one was Amr bin Alas. Okay? So these three Sahabi had accepted Islam. So Uthman bin Talha, his uh, his entire family was responsible for the custodianship of Kaaba. Okay, so they used to have the keys of the Kaaba. So, Muhammad Sallam. 
Uh, no, they were not Muslims. Usman bin Talha was the one who became Muslim just before the conquest of Makkah. They were, his family was living in Makkah. Yeah. So they had the keys of the Kaaba. So then Usman bin Talha, Usman bin Talha's family brought the keys to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he went inside and then he removed all the images, all the idols that were inside the Kaaba as well. So Kaaba is now free of idolatry. Okay. Now, once the Kaaba is, once Kaaba is free of idolatry, then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then delivers a sermon to all the people of Makkah. Okay. And this sermon, I'm just going to read it out. So there is no God but Allah alone. He has fulfilled his promise and he has aided his servant and he has destroyed all the enemies by himself. Okay? There is no God but Allah. Very, verily, every single claim and matter of Jahiliya has now been abolished. What does that mean? Any idea? So the Jahiliya anim animosity, right? The hierarchies and everything is abolished. Okay. Uh, except two things the sadna of the Kaaba and the Sifaya. Okay, so, uh, so the sadna is the custodianship of the Kaaba, which was with the family of uh, Usman bin Talha, and the Sifaya, which was with whom? Sifaya is the feeding of the pilgrims, which was with Quraysh. Usman bin Talha is, is, uh, is a part of the Quraysh, right? So it was within a sub tribe of the Quraysh. So which sub tribe? Any idea which sub tribe? Banu Hashim. Which sub tribe is Banu Hashim? Yes, thank you. <laughs> the tribe of the Prophet. <laughs> okay. So this feeding of the pilgrims, Sikaya was with was with Banu Hashim, and uh, Sadna was with the tribe of Usman Okay. So then later Ali Radhiratalan comes to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he says, Why don't you combine both of them and give it to us, give it to Banu Hashim? But then Muhammad Sallam says that no, the uh, custodianship of Kaaba is going to remain with the descendants, with Usman bin Tala and his descendants. Okay, and to this day, uh, the, the keys of the Kaaba, the symbolic keys, are with the descendants of Usman bin Tala to this day. Okay, so now uh, then he said that Allah has abolished the arrogance of Jahiliya, and all of you are from Adam, and Adam was from dust. Okay? So in Jahiliya, they used to have hierarchy. So I'm better than you. I'm I'm more. Uh, I'm, I'm more up the ladder, right? So I have more rights than you. So that has been abolished. And then um, uh, Muhammad Sallam then recites this verse from the Quran. Oh, humanity, indeed we created you from a male and a female, right? And made you into peoples and tribes so that you may get to know each other. Okay. And surely the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous amongst you. Allah is truly all-knowing, all of you. So this was the uh, abolished. Now the, from this ayah and from this sermon, Muhammad Sallam then abolished all the hierarchies that existed in the Jahiliya era. Okay, so you had slaves that were basically had no rights. They could be killed. They could, yeah, they could be tortured. Okay, and nobody would say anything. And then you had the lower lower people of the society, and then you had uh, hierarchies within the society. Okay, and then the higher up the hierarchy you are, and the more rights that you have. Okay, so Islam basically abolished it and brought everyone under the rule of law. Okay. So this rule of law and everything that we take for granted these days, because this was not very obvious back in the days, and Islam brought rule of law to the world, okay, not just to the Arabian Peninsula, then later to the world as well. And from Islam, then lots of things in Europe were inspired by Islam, including rule of law, including uh, including uh, innocent until proven guilty, lots of things, lots of things related to legal things were inspired by Islam. And then they adopted many of the things that were established during the lifetime of Muhammad Sallam and during their later caliphates. Okay, so now Muhammad Sallam, after giving the sermon, then uh, uh, asked the people of Makkah, "What do you think I'm going to do with you today?" Okay. Then the people of Makkah say that you are the most truthful, you are, you are the most merciful. Then Muhammad Sallam said what uh, Hazrat Yusuf said to his own brothers that you are free; there is no blame on you today. Okay, so Muhammad Sallam then forgave everyone. But there were then nine people who were not forgiven. Okay, and then we'll discuss about the nine people later. So then Muhammad Sallam, then after he forgave, generally forgave every uh, everyone from the Quraysh, then he asked Bilal. So this is symbolic as well, okay, because Bilal was a slave and he was also black and he was looked down upon. So he asked Bilal to go up to the roof of Kaaba and deliver the Azan. Okay. Now Bilal is climbing up the roof of Kaaba and delivering the Azan. Okay. And then two of the people from the noblemen of the Quraysh. By the name of Al Harith bin Hisham and Atta bin Asid. They look at 
uh, Bilal and Abu Sufyan was there with them as well. Okay, so they look at Bilal and uh, Atta bin Asid says that uh, thank God, thank Allah that my father is not alive today to see this. Okay, my father would not have. Yeah, so he's he's basically saying that it's such a humiliation for us that a black man is uh, going on the roof of Kaaba. Uh, it is a humiliation for Quraysh. Okay, so then. Al Haris bin Isham also agreed with him, but Abu Sufyan did not say anything. He remained silent. Okay. Now, after this, when Bilal he gave the azan, and then Muhammad Sallallahu then went to Al Haris and Atta, both of them, and then he said that this is what you said, Al Haris, and this is what you said, Atta. And then Al Haris and Atta was were like, there's no way he could have heard it. Okay, so they accepted Islam then. And then, as I mentioned, that there were nine people who were not pardoned. There was general pardon for everyone except these nine people. The first in the list was Ikrama bin Abi Jahal, and he had escaped Makkah. He had left Makkah okay? because he was the one who led uh, the campaign at the Battle of Oth, and then later subsequent <coughs> campaigns as well. And he also uh, tried to attack Muslims during the conquest of Makkah as well. So he was a bitter enemy. Then he later became a Sahabi. So Ikrama had a had a story that he was just trying to escape uh, Arabia and go somewhere else. So he was in a sh in a ship, okay. And in that ship, there were other people, other pagans with him. So what happened was that the ship was about to sink. So then uh, uh, the pagan said that now we have to pray. The other pagan said now we have to pray to Allah because our other idols are not going to help us. So then it struck Ikrama. Then realized that okay, then if I am praying to Allah right now, then why am I not accepting the message of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Okay. So then he went back to Makkah and he accepted Islam and he was forgiven. And later he became a Sahabi who played a prominent role in the wars of Ridda. Okay, that was the wars immediately after the death of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he also played a prominent role in the war against the Romans. And he died as a martyr, probably in the Battle of Ajnadain or Battle of Yarmouk. Right? So there is a dispute whether he was he was he was uh, he was martyred in the Battle of Ajnadain against the Romans or the Battle of Yarmouk again against the Romans. Okay. So now, uh, the second one was Abdul Uzza bin Khatal. Okay? And what he did was that he came to Medina, he accepted Islam, and then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent him to an expedition, okay, along with other Sahabi. So what he did was he killed that Sahabi, he took his wealth, and he went back to Makkah. Okay? So therefore, he was not spared, because he killed another Sahabi, he became a murtad, he went back to Makkah, he took all, his, all of his money, so therefore he was killed during the conquest of Makkah. Okay, and another one was Mikhias ibn Subaba, and uh, uh, in the previous, I think, sixth or seventh uh, uh, session, we discussed about the slander of Aisha Talan. So, slander of Aisha Talan was after the Battle of Al Muresi. Al Muresi was a battle against a particular tribe, and that tribe had helped the Quraysh during the Battle of Uhud. So, the Muslims went and fought against that tribe. So, when the Muslims were coming back. So this particular expedition was called Battle of Al Puresi, and in that expedition, then uh, one Sahabi was accidentally killed by another Sahabi. So that Sahabi that was accidentally killed was called Hisham bin Subaba, okay, and he was a Qureshi who was accidentally killed by an Ansari. Okay, so now what happened was that his brother, when he heard that his Mikhias ibn Subaba, he was still a pagan, and he was in Makkah when he heard that his brother has been killed by someone from Medina, so he pretended to accept Islam. And then he came to Medina, he pretended to accept Islam. And then afterwards, he took the blood money. Okay, he took the blood money from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 100 camels. And then he killed the Sahabi and he went back to Makkah. Okay. So therefore, <coughs> Mekhiyas ibn Subaba was also killed. Okay. And then Abdullah ibn Saad ibn Abi Sarah, Ab 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 ibn Abi Sar. Okay, this particular person has an interesting story. So he accepted Islam and he became a scribe of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then he left Islam, he went back to Makkah, and then, then he began writing against Islam and against Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So therefore, he was, uh, he was in the list, okay? and uh, that he was amongst the nine people who had to be killed. But then he was uh, friends with Usman Radhiya so he uh, pleaded with Usman Radhiya to uh, ask Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for forgiveness. So then Usman Radhiya Talaan went to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then he asked if Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam may forgive uh, Abdullah. Then Muhammad Sallam was silent for some time, and then he didn't say anything. And then afterwards, he said, "Okay, I forgive." Okay. So then Muhammad Sallam then told us that after after Usman and Abdullah they were gone. Then Muhammad Sallam told the other Sahabi 
then when I was silent, why didn't you kill him? Okay, because he, this guy is on the list, you should have killed him, right? Other, so then the other sahabi said, we didn't knew, you should have, I mean, maybe you should have said something, made a gesture with your eyes or something, right? Then Muhammad Sallallahu said that uh, it is not befitting a prophet that he makes gesture with his eyes, okay? So this particular person was also, uh, was also forgiven. And then Fatana and Sara, these two were the were girls who used to sing against the Muslims, against Muhammad Sallallahu and also against Islam. So Fatana was killed and Sara was spared. Okay. And Habbar bin Aswad, anyone remembers Habbar bin Aswad? Habbar bin Aswad was the one that when Zainab, when she was leaving Makkah and she was going to Medina, right? So then Habbar bin Aswad was the one who, uh, who tried to stop Zainab and then he uh, pricked the camel of Zainab and then Zainab was pregnant, so she fell down and she got a miscarriage. Okay, and then she died later. So Habbar bin Aswat was the one who tried to attack Zainab. Okay, and then because of that, she suffered from a miscarriage and she later died of the wounds that she sustained. Okay? So Habbar bin Aswat was also on the list of the nine people who had to be killed. Okay? So now Habbar bin Aswat was later spared. He was also let go of. He uh, became a Muslim and he asked for forgiveness, so he was spared. And anyone knows uh, Habbar bin Aswat? He has an interesting. A relationship with the not relationship but anyone knows Habari dynasty anyone has heard about Habari dynasty no so Habar bin Aswad his descendants right one of his descendants was uh, in the army of Muhammad bin Qasim anyone knows Muhammad bin Qasim who was Muhammad bin Qasim um, yeah, yeah the first Muslim expedition to India right? so the, about 711 AD okay so the, it was sent by a Hajjaj bin Yusuf. You know Hajjaj bin Yusuf, everyone, right? Hajjaj bin Yusuf was the Umayyad governor and he was uh, he sent uh, Muhammad bin Qasim to an expedition in India, right? In what is modern day Pakistan. So in one of those expeditions, the descendant of Habbar bin Aswad was also there, okay? And then their descendants settled permanently in modern day Pakistan and Sindh, okay? And they established a dynasty called the Habbarid dynasty. Okay, and that was uh, that dynasty. We still have the coins of that particular dynasty. It was in modern day Pakistan. Okay, so Habbar bin Aswad, the same Habbar bin Aswad was the uh, ancestor of the Habbarids. Okay, and then Al Huwaris ibn Nubair, this particular person, when Umm Kulsum and Fatma they were trying to migrate to Medina, he chased them and he tried to harm them. Okay, so therefore Ali bin Abi Talib killed both of them. Oh, sorry, killed this particular person. Now, and the final person the ninth person was Bashi himself okay and Bashi he fled to he fled to Taif and then later when people of Taif they accepted Islam so he came with them and he accepted Islam and then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if you uh, if you know the story then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then asked him how he killed Hamza and then he told the entire story how he killed Hamza okay that he was hiding behind and then when Hamza when he saw this uh, uh, an opening then he went and he thrust the spear and then it went inside out. Okay, so then Muhammad Sallam began crying, and then he said, "Okay, I have accepted your apology. You are forgiven, but when, do not come, do not show your face to me, right? Because it brings me the memories of Hamza. So do not show your face." So Vashi then uh, used to avoid Muhammad Sallam whenever Muhammad Sallam used to come. Then he used to go, and then later Vashi was the one who participated in the Ridda wars as well, and he killed Musail al Kazab with the spear as well. Okay, so he he. Uh, killed a false prophet and he participated in jihad as well. Okay, so now uh, amongst these nine people, four people are killed actually and five people are forgiven as well. Okay, so four people, total of 18 people are killed in the conquest of the entire Mac uh, of Makkah, which was the center of uh, worship in, in the whole of Arabia. Okay, uh, amazing conquest. Now, after that, Muhammad Sallallahu then takes an oath with the woman. Now he calls the woman and he, he uh, uh, Muhammad Sallam then, because this is the ayah of the Quran, which tells Muhammad Sallam what he has to say. So the ayah says that, O Prophet, when the believing women come to you, pledging to you that they will neither associate anything with Allah, nor steal, nor fornicate, nor kill the children, nor falsely attribute children to the husbands, nor disobey you in what is right, then accept the pledge and ask Allah to forgive them. Surely Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. Okay. So Muhammad Sallam asked the woman, okay, you are you you are not going to associate any partners with Allah. So then one woman which was there and she was peeled, so she was completely peeled. Okay. So she said that you did not 
uh, uh, you do not ask this from the men. You are only asking from a woman. Then everyone else said that no, this is the message of Islam. Okay, so this is what he accepted. That this is what he asked from everyone. Okay, so no, everyone ignored him. So that uh, everyone ignored her. Then uh, Muhammad Sallam said that uh, you are not going to steal. Then that particular woman again shouted and said that my husband. Uh, my husband is very stingy, so I sometimes steal from him. Okay, so then Muhammad Sallam recognized that this is him. So then Muhammad Sallam said that this is him. So then she said that yes, I'm him. So then Muhammad Sallam did not say anything, and then he uh, then he went on to the third one. Okay, so neither you are going to kill your children. Okay, so then him again gave a reply that kill our children. Yeah, we were the ones who raised our children and then you killed them in father. <laughs> so then Umar Adhani started laughing at this. Okay? And then Muhammad Sallam took the entire pledge with the, with the woman and then he asked Umar Adhani to take the actual pledge and then the woman of the uh, woman of the woman of Makkah also ex uh, accepted Islam and mass. Okay? Now at this particular juncture uh, Surah Nasr was also re revealed. Yes, yes, in the accepted Islam. Yes, yes. Surah Nasr was also repeated. Is Aja and Abu Bilam Shapon regime is Mara Hanim, is Aja and Asulai Walfat, or Aitan Nasayat Huna, Kidin Lahi of Baja. Can anyone translate it for me? It's a big behind the Obika was talking in our Canada. Is Aja and Asulai Walfat? What does that mean? When the Nasr helped and the victory of Allah comes, right? Aitan Nasa, you see, Yad Huluna, the Dakhiria enter. In the, in the religion of Allah, Afwaja, in bunches, crowds, right, in massive numbers. Right? So, this surah also indicates that not only Makkans are accepted Islam, but many, many, many tribes in Arabia are also accepted Islam because now Arabia is the center of worship, center of uh, religion in Arabia. Now, if Makkah has been conquered, then the rest of the uh, tribes in Arabia also accept Islam. Okay? So, for sabbe bihamdi rabbi ka bastaqfir and glorify and praise your Lord and ask for forgiveness. In nahu kana tawaba, verily he is. Tawaba, what, what is tawaba going to be? Accepted, yeah, yeah, of returning or accepted repentance. Yeah. Okay. So now, uh, Muhammad, uh, after this surah is revealed, then Muhammad Sallam is interacting with the Makkans and now Ansar are now, uh, they are a bit worried. Any idea why would they be worried? Excellent, right? So they are they, they are seeing Muhammad Sussram interacting interacting with his own family because Quraysh is like a large family. So they are worried that Muhammad Sussram is going to stay in Makkah. Okay. And then when this worry is then reaches Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then Muhammad Sallam goes to the Ansar and he says this particular phrase, right? Life is your life and death is your death, which means that my life is your life and my death is your death, which means that we are going to be together and I'm going to return to Medina. And if you remember in the pledge of Aqaba, Muhammad Sussalam also gave the pledge that he's going to go to Medina. Okay, and he's going to stay at Medina and be the leader. So therefore, as we mentioned that Muhammad Sussalam never reneged on his promises, on his pledge. So Muhammad Sussalam assured them that he's going to go back to Medina with them. And then Ansar also became happy. Okay. Now, uh, Makkah is removed from idolatry. So the vicinity of Makkah has all, uh, also has to be removed from idolatry as well. Right? So Muhammad Sallam sent expeditions led by Khalid bin Walid to destroy Uzza, which was one of the main idols. And then Amr bin Ras to destroy Suba, which was also one of the idols. And then Saad bin Zaid, he was also uh, he was also sent into another expedition to destroy Manam. So the major idols surrounding Makkah are also destroyed by the Muslims. Okay. Now, after the, after Makkah is conquered, then Muhammad Sallam also gives many sermons. So the details are not, uh, I have obscured the details because it's, it's, a, it's a long, uh, the, the details are very long and the class is short. So I have uh, uh, excluded the details. Okay. So now Muhammad Sallam has conquered Makkah and now the last bastion of paganism is Taif. Again, Taif has two tribes, two main tribes. Which ones? Any idea? Hawazin and Safif. Okay. And Hawazin, does Muhammad Sallam does he have any sort of relationship? Not, not relationship, but yeah, is he is he? I mean, affiliated with Hawazin in any sense? Yeah, but Muhammad Sussan did not went to Habshan. The Muslims went to Habshan. Yeah, so Hawazin, uh, Khalifa, 
anyone remembers Hanima Sadia? She was from Banu Saad, and Banu Saad is a sub tribe of Hawazin. Okay, so Hawazin and Saqif were uh, Hawazin and Saqif were the two tribes that were in Taif, and both of them were on idolatry. So now Makkah has been conquered, and these are the only two main tribes that are remaining. The main city, the major city that is remaining on paganism. So they, they decide to attack Makkah and to take Makkah for themselves. Okay, and to, to reintroduce idolatry. So they send emissaries to different tribes which are still on paganism. And then they gather an army of 20,000 and they decide to attack Makkah. So now when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he hears about this, he stays at Makkah for about 19 days. And then he hears about the Battle of Hunayn. Uh, so not the Battle of Hunayn. He hears about uh, Habazin and Safif trying to attack Makkah. So he takes the people with them, about 10,000 from the conquest of Makkah. And because 10,000 people participated in the conquest of Makkah and 2,000, the new converts. Okay, So he takes about 12,000 with him. And he marches to Taif to meet them on the battlefield. Okay. And he marches on Taif on the 6th of Shabal and he arrives at a valley outside Taif called Hanayn on the 10th of Shabal. Okay. Ramadan has passed and Shabal is, we are now in Shabal. Okay. Now, the Habazin and Saqif, Saqif basically were the primary uh, primary perpet uh, perpetrators. So Saqif, they, their chief was Malik ibn Auf al-Nasri. Okay. And he was the leader of the entire army. So what he did was, he was a young man. So what he did was that he wanted to motivate his his army, his people. So he brought the flocks, he brought the women, he brought the children, he brought everyone with them on the battlefield. Okay. So now he, when uh, another experienced person by the name of Duraid ibn Sima, he was also, uh, he was also in the army. So when he heard about this and when he got to know that everyone, the flocks and everything has been brought to the battlefield, then he asked Mal uh, he asked Malik to take them back, okay? Because this is not a good strategy. But Malik was adamant that no, this is what we are going to do. This is going to motivate our people to fight against the Muslims, okay? Because if you are going to lose the fight, then your entire family is going to go. Then your entire flock and your money, everything is going to go with the Muslims. Okay? So he said that no, I am going to. I have brought them here in order to motivate our, our soldiers to attack the Muslims with fury, okay? So now the Muslims. 12,000 of them and at the Battle of Badr, there were only 313 or 315 and now they're 12,000. So some of them started becoming arrogant. Okay, and they're new Muslims as well. So they see 12,000 people. So some of them say that, okay, there's no way that we are going to get defeated by when we are 12,000. Okay. So when Muhammad hears about this, then he prays to Allah and he tells his people that there was one prophet back in the days. Then he was also, when he saw his army, his army was huge. So he also became a little bit arrogant. And then Allah sent a disease and his entire army was destroyed. Okay. So then the Muslims arrive in this valley called Hunayn because the Hawazin and Saqib, they're also, uh, they're also there. Now, once they arrive there, so the strategy of the Hawazin and the Saqib is, if you can see this, this is the modern day uh, valley. So it is surrounded by mountains and this is the narrow valley. So this maybe placed a few of the tribes from Hawazin here. Okay, so giving an illusion to the Muslims that there are very few soldiers from Hawazin and they're here and they're going to fight here. Okay, so the Muslims, they attack them and they start to flee. So the Muslims, they thought that now they're fleeing. Okay, so we, we can just chase them. And the Muslims went into the valley. And what Saqif had done is that they had placed the archers on top of the mountains. Okay, and they were hidden. The Muslims didn't knew that. Now they're trapped in a valley. And the archers are placed in the mountains and the archers they show themselves and they start throwing the arrows from above okay the arrows are coming from above and you can just imagine the chaos and the Mus and many many of the muslims are getting injured some of them even martyred as well so the muslims they start running here and there right because the arrows are coming so they have to seek protection and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then starts calling the muslims he sees that the arrows are being showered from the top he starts calling the muslims then eventually the Main Sahabi, right? Abu Bakr, Umar, Radha, Radha, Usman, Radha, Radha, Ali, Radha, Radha. Right? All of these main Sahabi, Zubayr, Tatha, they then gather around Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then slowly the people from Qadabiyah, they also gather around Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then slowly the entire army, then it uh, re reorganizes itself and then attacks the people who were there, okay? And then uh, the Saqif and the Hawazin, they did not have any plan B, they only had a plan, uh, only had a plan A, so they thought they were going to kill the Muslims with this. But the Muslims reorganized and attacked them, so they started fleeing. Okay. And when they started fleeing, 
then Muhammad Sallam then divided his army into different uh, different battalions, and he sent them after them. Okay, why? Any idea? Why did he not just let them go and send the battle battalions after them? Huh? To eradicate why? 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 Why do you? Why do you have to eradicate them? Yeah, but you have. But yeah, but still, uh, they can just take the flock, take the sheep. Why are they going after them? Excellent. They will come back, right? So this is what used to happen. If you are going to leave them, then they are going to reorganize and come back and attack you again. So therefore, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then goes and chase them, and they go to Taif and they lock themselves inside Taif. Okay, and Taif had thick walls, and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had asked the Sahabi even before that, even before uh, a few days, a, a few months maybe, or a few years before the conquest of Makkah, he has asked the Sahabi to learn how to, uh, because they had experienced battles against the Jews, so they wanted to learn. How to uh, develop siege engines, okay? battering rams, okay, catapults. So the Muslims learned how to build catapults, how to build battering rams, okay? and this is going to what is going to help them in this siege. So now Taif is under siege by the Muslims, and also those turtle shells. You know turtle shells. So if when, whenever there is a siege, so the the people who are there inside, okay, so they throw many things: the rocks, boiling water, boiling oil, in order to kill people. Right? Logs, okay. So the turtle shells are what protect uh, the soldiers, the soldiers which are outside the siege, which are outside the city, the turtle shell protects them from the oil and from the hot water. Okay. So the Muslims then built the catapults and they also built the battering rams and they started uh, bombarding the walls of Taif, but then the walls were very strong. Okay. And then uh, the Muslims and Muhammad Sallam then asked the people of Taif if there's anyone who wants to accept, he can join. Okay. So therefore many slaves from Taif joined the Muslims. But the Muslims were not able to penetrate the wall, so therefore they returned back. Okay. And then the Sahabi asked Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to pray against the Khaif. Muhammad Sallam then refused to pray against the Khaif and against them for their destruction, but he said that Allah uh, guide the people of Saqib to Islam. And this is what eventually happened later. The people of Taif and Mas, Habad and Saqib, they accepted Islam. Okay. And then this, the war booty from this particular uh, battle was the largest war booty. That Muhammad Sallam, that uh, amongst the battles that Muhammad Sallam fought. Okay, so about six thousand prisoners of war, among about twenty-four thousand Ferraris or camels, and about forty thousand goats. Goats will be like what? Yeah. Will be yeah, foxy or whatever, right? So bike, uh, Anwar's bike. So about forty thousand bikes, twenty-four thousand uh, Ferraris, and six thousand prisoners. Of war, okay, so the largest. The largest, uh, uh, the largest booty, war booty that the Muslims have received, and then Muhammad Sallam then gave lots of this war booty amongst the people who who were still pagans, but they, so Muhammad Sallam wanted to give them so that they accept Islam. Okay, so when Suhail bin Abbas, Safan bin Umayyah, when they saw that Muhammad Sallam is giving all of them away to the people he does not even know that well. Okay, so then when they saw this and he's keeping nothing from for himself, then they also accepted Islam. They said that this cannot be a king. This can only come from a prophet. Okay, so this brings an end to this session. Any question? JazakAllah khair. Any questions? And Battle of Hunayn, let, let me just quickly mention it. It's also mentioned in the Quran by name. Okay. So Allah has already given you victory in many regions and on the day of Hunayn, when your great number pleased you, okay, but it did not avail you at all and the earth was confining you with its vastness. Then you turned back fleeing. Then Allah sent down his tranquility among, upon his messenger and upon the believers and sent down soldiers whom you did not see and punished those who disbelieved. And that is the recompense of the disbelievers. Okay. So this is the battle of Hunayn in a nutshell. So, we like summarize the battle of Hunayn. The first was Badr. First major was Badr. Yeah. Then Badr. Yes. Then Badr. No. After all, it was the Khandab. The battle of uh, yeah, Ahzab or Khandaf, yeah. and then after that, major battle. <coughs> Cyber, yeah. There were many expeditions, many, many expeditions. Muhammad Sallam himself participated in it is said he participated in 28 Ghazwa. So, 28 means three sorry, three wars per year. Three wars per year himself, and the others that he sent were many, many, of course. 
Any questions? Yes, please. Yep. Yeah, what happened? was killed and Sarah was spared. I don't know. It's not mentioned in the books. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Abdullah ibn Sa'd. They know they had skills as people after the first time. But the idea of killing a Muslim, the one who has left the Islam, who is still in the temple, any idea? It stems from the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Bukhari. Anyone who leaves the religion, kill him. So that is the hadith. So, when was the Sharia Islam leaving the religion? So, when was the Sharia Islam leaving the religion? So, that is the hadith. When was it said? I'm not sure. Maybe it was said here. Maybe it was said before. I'm not sure. I'll have to. But it, it does stem from the hadith in the Bukhari. Yeah. Yeah. But that is, of course, there are many conditions. Yeah? That is 